Good morning, Jason here, Birchfield Family Farm. Pretty nice day out here on the ranch, breezy today. Wind out of the west, about nine mile per hour, mid fifties today. Definitely tell things are starting to cool off here. So walk you around today, show you what we got going on on the farm. Quick peek at uh, Mui's out there. They are ready to move. We'll get on that here in a bit we have been harvesting honey this season a frame at a time and i actually have a little experiment going on here move this hive in underneath our three-sided barn just to get them out of the cold rain try and keep them a little drier i really really like this hive um these are just a few extra frames on the top here but this hive's been very, very docile this year, and I just, I love working with them. And uh, I noticed <laughs> this year, um, they don't have any honey. They don't have any honey stores going into winter. And that is a, obviously a major problem. So uh, I am not <clears throat> suited up. I am going to try and slip this frame in here very quickly. This could be quite entertaining. Take this one out. You can see there's our cluster down in there. Here comes one already. And I'm gonna put this frame that we scraped. Yeah, I know, we've still got some honey. Let them feed on this. Clean it up. See them coming up here. Time is limited. Go ahead and button it back up. I'm, uh, I'm still thinking through our plan uh, for that hive. We do have two hives. Uh, this guy over here looks a little better going into winter, but uh, that one in the barn there, that, that's gonna be a struggle. We have made some uh, sugar pollen patties mixed up and uh, supposedly supposed, supposed to be good for uh, winter feeding, but I don't know. I need a plan on on those guys. If you have any suggestions other than I'm not going to pinch the queen and combine the hives. I'm not. I'm not going to kill a queen. Not doing that. Um, if you have any other suggestions, let us know. We made some homemade apple cider fresh last night. It was absolutely delicious. Made uh, just a small batch. Just did a gallon. But uh, thanks to thanks to Hoka Bee Farm here in Oxford for the apples. They had a very abundant crop this year and decided they would share with us. So we worked as a family last night and made some of these into cider. But these are the uh, the bad ones. Did have some go bad, and the roosters are turning them into fertilizer today. Just loving them. Get them, boys. <laughs> okay, cattle are going absolutely nutso. Let's get our fence turned off. Get these guys moved to paddock number three. What do you think, Em? You about ready, sweetheart? Huh? Looking good. Mr. Patrick, been rolling in some some mud, Daisy, Ella, Mr. Big. You guys ready to move? Hmm? Ready to move, bud? All right, come on. All right, come on, boys. Come on. Things here 
Emma. Good grief. Definitely, definitely get some milk in that bag. We are getting closer. We'll keep you posted. I think it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be any day here. Definitely in the month of November. Looking at uh, paddock three here. <clears throat> getting into that time of the season here where getting down to the nitty gritty in terms of grazing, we do have some, some forage on, you know, looking pretty good in spots. Other spots, not so much. This is a, I believe, a 33 day rest. And, uh, you know, for mid November, I'm tickled to death. But, you know, once we hit the, the spot where the grass really stops or slows significantly, then it's, it's more a matter of uh, taking hay out to each paddock. But I would say, I would say we'll get a day out of this save our hay today maybe but uh everybody's looking good those of you who know us best here on the farm know that i'm pretty constantly bumping into ideas um you know most of them harebrained uh most of them fail had a few that have worked, but uh, you know it's it's constant problem solving out here. It's it's constant, um, you know, evolving into solutions. What works, what doesn't. Different generations of things, right? That you come up with. I came came across an idea, an an article actually uh, yesterday talking about um, dung beetles. Yeah. Hey, very very interesting and, and those of you who have followed us know that we've you know we, we struggle with these cow pats uh, we were just doing the quarter acre paddocks so you get we get quite a bit of, of manure uh, to the extent that when we return uh, 30 30 some odd days later we and we still have those pats and the cattle will eat around those we're um, you know not I don't feel like we're fully utilizing the, uh, the paddocks in that way. And so yeah, we did some experimenting with chickens this year, ran some roosters, and it was, it was promising. Uh, had some results, it was good, but an awful lot of labor, right? And uh, pulling the, the roosters or chickens behind cattle in the paddocks, we could certainly do it. Uh, but this, this article on the dung beetles was really, really amazing. Uh, some of these stats, you know, they, they called the dung beetle the the SWAT team of, of sewage, uh, basically, you know, and you've got three types, right? dwellers, tunnelers, and, and rollers, I think is, is what they called it. You can look it up. But, uh, you know, I just I had, some, had some questions. One, one of the articles uh, was on cattle uh, claiming that a, under the right conditions, a dung beetle population can, can bury manure pats in, in 36 hours. So that got my attention. You know, obviously no real labor involved there. Uh, you know, do we have dung beetles on the farm now? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, we, we've got some things that I noticed some tunneling. Uh, I guess I need to pay more attention, but my main question is, you know, let's say you would, you would wanna inoculate your pastures with, with these dung beetles, get a population going. Number one, you can't be worming. The uh, ivermectin and, and dewormers, chemical dewormers, are going to kill your your beetle population. So that uh, we 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 don't we don't deworm here. So we're good there. But my main question is, why is no one that I can find in the regenerative ag vein tapping into this? Really, you know, raising and selling these beetles for this purpose. I mean, if they, if they do what they're saying they do, uh, I, I can't find anybody that, uh, you know, really is uh, wanting to help the small farmer, you know, get a population of these established. And that includes, you know, profiting off the raising and the, and the selling of these these creatures. Probably a good reason why it's, it's not being done. Uh, again, 
yes, they do occur naturally. Uh, I, I don't, <laughs> we definitely don't see pads disappearing in 36 hours, but uh, I guess I need to pay better attention to our, our native beetle species here and really start to identify those. Uh, but if you, if you know of someone who's, who's into this, who's raising these and, you know, selling these, uh, these dung beetles, uh, species that would work in, in Southern Ohio, reach out, let me know. You can see, obviously, with some of these pads, 30 plus days old, we do not have a whole lot of beetle activity out here going on, for whatever reason. I see maybe a little bit of tunneling, but uh, certainly largely still intact. We've been uh, <clears throat> adding a little more manure stuff from the stalls in the barn here on top of the uh, chopped up leaves got an ambient temperature measurement here right around 50 let's see what our see what our piles at we had some rain yesterday I bet that will help our temperature here okay right about 130 today so that rain and I think the new stuff we put on here Kind of, uh, <clears throat> you know, immediately cooling off a little. I think we were mid 140s a few days ago, but uh, pretty cool. Jumping up just a hair above 130 there. Amazing that it gets this hot. Got to be something we can do with that heat. I, I saw a guy. Uh, this is not our idea, but you know how we put the, the four inch line down here just to aerate the bottom. He had actually had a fan and a uh, line like that on the bottom. And he was blowing air through the bottom of the pile just to keep it from going anaerobic. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, put that air through there, really. Yeah, it had it on a timer running a couple hours a day. I thought that was kind of neat. But, uh, 131, pretty cool. Let's head out here and take a look at the U's. See if Mr. Sonny is making any progress here on our breeding season. Apologize for the sound. It's windy today. Okay, two, three, looks like we have one more. That is bred. Don't like to see nothing like that, and that and that, but that's good there. And yeah, those two there are covered up. Now again, you know, is this one here bred? You know, I, I'm not sure. If I had to guess, I would say no. She probably scooted when he mounted, attempted to mount. But uh, those are good. Those two are good there. So I would say three, possibly a fourth there. But I'll mark down that third one for today for sure. monitoring his progress. You know, I had mentioned uh, one of the reasons for doing an earlier um, lambing this year, and consequently an earlier breeding, was to try and have them beyond that 60 day mark when we hit the dry weather in July this year. Um, the other reason is because I want to wait probably six weeks after we pull Sunny out and I want to introduce Fritz. So the reason for that is because I do not know for sure that Sunny is viable. And so we have the potential to completely miss a year of lambing uh, if he is not viable. I have no reason to really believe that, that he's not. Um, but you know, this way, depending on the date, uh, if we can, we can keep, you know, that six or eight weeks in between when Sonny's out and when Fritz is back in with them, uh, we can tell, depending on when the lambing happens, we can tell who, who is the sire. And that's important because we register our sheep and we want to keep track of that. So that's the other reason for an earlier breeding.